Okay, so I need uh, I need some help this morning. Uh, Kyle Heist, where you at? Kyle, come on down. There he is. Come up on stage. Um, I also am going to need some assistance from. Oh, Larry Pachauer is walking in as we speak. Larry, can you come join me on the stage, please? Look at you, just in time. All right, give it up for Larry Pachauer. Okay. So what I was told very recently is that my friend Kyle here is one of the foremost experts in Taylor Swift on our campus. Um, we're going to put that to the test today. What I know for a fact is that Dr. Larry Pachauer is one of the foremost experts on lamentations on our campus. So we're going to have a little competition here at the beginning of my message. It's called Taylor Swift or Lamentations. All right, so put the first slide up there. She cries herself to sleep at night, tears soaking her pillow. Kyle, Taylor Swift or Lamentations? Um, I'm going to say Lamentations. Larry. I'm supposed to say something else. Taylor Swift, too. Taylor right? Swift or Lamentations? Oh. <laughs> I'm going to say Taylor Swift. Okay, so Lamentations, Taylor Swift. What's the answer? Lamentations. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right, next one, next one. Your knives and swords and weapons that you use against me. Kyle. Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. Okay, sounds confident. Larry. Taylor Swift. <laughs> okay, what is that? That is, yes, that is Taylor Swift. Why you got to be so mean? All right, next one. My eyes are blind with tears. My stomach is in a knot. Larry, I'm going to have you go first this time. Translation is this? I'm, I'm not sure. Lamentations. Lamentations, okay. Uh, lamentations. All right, lamentations from both of you. Oh, and lamentations it is. Lamentations 211. Okay, next one. Next one. You're like a lion ready to pounce. Larry. <laughs> I'll say lamentations. I sure hope it's lamentations. Okay, lamentations, what is it? It is, Lamentations 3, okay. This yearning in the deep part of my heart for you. Kyle. Uh, yearning seems like a big word for Taylor. Uh, I'm going to take your advice and go with the Lamentations. Lamentations, okay. Taylor. All right, what is it? Taylor Swift. <laughs> All right, next one. I'll never forget the trouble. The poison I've swallowed. Hmm. Mm. I don't know. Kyle. Uh, can I pass? No, nope, I can't pass. Um, I'm going to say Lamentations. Lamentations? Okay, it didn't sound confident, though. I'm going to say Taylor. All right. Taylor Swift. Oh, it's Lamentations. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next one. But there's one, uh, but there's one thing I remember, so I can keep a grip on hope. Taylor. Kyle. Uh, I'm going to say Lamentations. Okay. I was going to say Lamentations. That is Lamentations. Lamentations 321. Next one. I'm aching, no past, nowhere to hide. Larry. Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift? It is Taylor Swift. Good job. Next one. All we are, I think this is the last one. All we are is skin and bone. All we are is skin and bone. Uh, it doesn't sound very helpless, so I'm going to say Lamentations. Lamentations, okay. I'm going with Lamentations. Also. Okay, the answer is Taylor Swift. Okay, hold on. Show the next one. Trick question. Also, it is in Lamentations. All right, thank you very much. So, there's probably multiple lessons that could be taken away from such an exercise. Um, one conclusion that could be drawn is that perhaps Taylor Swift needs some counseling. Um, 
at what point does she start to think, maybe the problem is me? Um, I think another lesson that could potentially be learned from this exercise is that Lamentations is not necessarily a cheerful book. Um, this, is not, this is not a happy book, which I'm not sure what we would expect from a book with the title of Lamentations. Um, if, if the title of any book is a promise about what that book contains, we shouldn't expect a bunch of sunshine and lollipops from a book with a name like Lamentations. Um, in, in the ancient world, in antiquity, what I've actually been told is it was known by a different name. It was known by actually the first Hebrew word in the book of Lamentations, which is the word eka, which is translated how. That's what the book was known by. But it's not how, the, with, followed by a question mark. It's not how as a question. It's really how followed by an exclamation point. Uh, the word as it's used in the book of Lamentations, this word how, eka, is full of shock. It's full of sorrow. This word is full of wonder at the destruction of a city that's so thorough, a destruction that is so complete and so devastating that the prophet Jeremiah, as he looks out over the city, can only exclaim, how deserted lies the city, once so full of people. How deserted lies the city, once so full of people. Jer the Lamenta Lamentations is sort of like Job. It's a book full of mourning. It's a book full of heartbreak and suffering. The difference is that the suffering of Job is personal. Job encounters suffering on a personal level. In Lamentations, that suffering is amplified for an entire city, indeed an entire nation. Lamentations is a post-apocalyptic book. It's a post-apocalyptic book. It is the funeral song for a city that's completely been laid waste by the great power of Babylon. It is a song of weeping. Lamentations. It's a, so it's a song of leaping, weeping voiced by Jeremiah the prophet for the survivors who have been left behind with less than nothing. That's the book of Lamentations. And the, lam the, the language of Lamentations... The language that we encounter in the book of Lamentations shocks our sensibilities. The poetic structure of the book, it, this, is, this is one of the most beautifully constructed books in the, entire, in the entire Bible. It's very intricately and intentionally uh, designed, this book. The 22-letter the Hebrew alphabet provides the structure for each of the first four chapters of the book. Each of the first four chapters of the book contains an acrostic structure. So each verse begins with the subsequent letter in the Hebrew alphabet, very carefully constructed. Chapter 3 is not just the physical center of the poem, it's also the lyrical and theological center of the poem as well. Chapter 3 forms a chiasm, or helps to form a chiasm, of the entire book of Lamentations. Chapter 3 is 66 verses long instead of just 22 verses long. And, and in those 66 verses, we have each letter of the Hebrew alphabet repeated three different times. It's a very carefully designed poem. In chapter 5, this acrostic structure breaks down. In chapter 5, there is no acrostic structure, even though it still has 22 verses. And there's a lot of theories as to why that might be the case. My, my personal feeling is the acrostic structure breaks down in chapter 5 because chapter 5 is a, is a prayer, a prayer of desperation uttered to God. The, the structure of Lamentations is, is exquisite. The structure of Lamentations is is refined and purposeful, but the language of Lamentations, the language of this book is jarring to us. It's shocking to us. Let me just give you an example of this in Lamentations chapter 2. Look at us, God. Think it over. Have you ever treated anyone like this? Should women eat their own babies, the very children they raise? Should priests and prophets be murdered in the master's own sanctuary? Boys and old men lie in the gutters of the streets. My young men and women killed in their prime. Angry you killed them. In cold blood, cut them down without mercy. You invited, like friends to a party, men to swoop down and attack so that on the big day of God's wrath, no one would get away. The children I loved and reared, gone, gone, gone. A text like that will ruin your devotional moment. They aren't going to put that text on any wall art at For All Bible to hang in our living rooms, okay? 
But listen, if we're going to take the message of Scripture seriously, if we're going to take the Word of God seriously, it won't take us very long to cut ourselves upon the sharp edges of the human experience in Scripture. The language of lamentations is only shocking to those people who haven't themselves experienced true desolation and abandonment. Or perhaps it's shocking to those who have only learned to speak in cheery cliches about God and life. So you might be wondering, well, this is a happy sermon. I thought, you know, it started out so promising. I mean, got lamentations and Taylor Swift and, you know, but now I'm just kind of depressed. I'm kind of bummed out. Um, what exactly is Chad supposed to be speaking on today? Well, we're today starting a series um, in chapel that's going to cover several weeks on forgiveness, uh, which is a good series. There are very few things that are as Christian as forgiveness. It is, frankly, impossible to have a healthy marriage, to have a healthy church, to have a healthy campus or dorm, to have a healthy discipleship. If forgiveness is not mastered and practiced regularly, this is a very good series for us to have. But my topic, however, is just a little bit different. My topic is on the idea of forgiving God. That's my topic, forgiving God. And I have to admit that I did not receive this topic with joy and thanksgiving. Um, I might have whined a little bit. You could ask my life group. Um, I mean, after all, last year I preached on Job. I did a book, series, a book sermon on the book of Job. And this year I find myself doing a book sermon on the book of Lamentations. What is going on with, with these sermon topics? Um, I must be the professor of happiness. Um, <laughs> but forgiving God, when I think about forgiving God, it just seems like such a modern man's dilemma. Modern man has killed God, but continues to be haunted by his presence. God, the hero, is dismissed or mocked, but God, the villain, God the bully, God who is so mean to us, is reviled and feared. It reminds me of a conversation that George Costanza had one day, years ago, on Seinfeld with his therapist. It was, it was, in, the, it was in an episode where George was, it looked like George finally might, he finally might actually become successful in life. It looked like things were all starting to fall his way. And just in this moment, when it looked like he finally would be a success in life, in that moment, he became paranoid and obsessed with this idea that God was going to give him cancer and take it all, all away from him. And so he, he's sitting there, and he's, 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 he's talking to his therapist, and he says, I'm convinced God would never let me be successful. God would never let me be successful. And his therapist looks at him, and, he says, and she says, well, George, I thought you didn't believe in God. And George responds by saying, well, I do for the bad things. I do believe in God for the bad things. And that seems like such a picture of the modern man. When I first went looking through scripture for examples of someone forgiving God, I was just a little bit disappointed with what I found. Of all the people that you might imagine had reason to forgive God, you think of Abraham and that little prank that God pulled on him on Mount Moriah, right? Or you think, you think of Moses and his close-but-no-cigar trip to the promised land. Or you think about David literally running for his life in the desert. Joseph being imprisoned, not for doing the wrong thing, but for doing the right thing. Paul being struck blind, beaten, imprisoned, shipwrecked. Even Job. I could not find one single verse that said... And they found place in their hearts to forgive God and move on with their lives. It's only modern man with his inflated view of himself who dares to say, Lord, how many times must I forgive God when he sins against me? Up to seven times? The idea of forgiving God just seems on the surface of it to be so sacrilegious and irreverent. But, if you look again at the pages of Scripture... What you do actually find quite a bit of is questioning God, anger at God, frustration, confusion directed at God. You hear it sung from the mouth of David in the Psalms. You hear it prayed from the mouth of Hannah. You hear it grumbled from the collective mouths of Israel virtually every chance they got in the desert. 
You hear it cried from the mouths of Elijah and Isaiah and Job. You hear it even shouted from the mouths of the saints in heaven in Revelation 6. You hear it most powerfully from the mouth of Jesus himself as he's hanging on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I was drawn to Lamentations for this message because this complaint, it runs throughout the entire book of Lamentations. In Lamentations chapter 2, verse 5, it says, The Lord is like an enemy. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever had those moments? The Lord is like an enemy. This is not the God who leads me beside still waters and restores my soul. Lamentations 3, 1. I'm the man who has seen trouble. Trouble coming from the lash of God's anger. He took me by the hand and he walked me into pitch darkness. Yet he's given me the back of his hand over and over and over again. Have you ever felt that way? Lamentations 3.8. Even when I cry out for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has barred my way with blocks of stone. He has made my paths crooked. He has not made my path straight. He's made the path before me crooked. Have you ever felt that way? Based on the message of Scripture, what I'm seeing is that asking questions of God, complaining to God, frustration with God, even feelings of abandonment by God, should be understood as a common part of the human experience. And they are, aren't they? A common part of our human experience? There is not a single person in this room today, I'm confident, who has not at some point or another, maybe even today, struggled with feelings of disappointment, abandonment, anger, confusion with God. All of us have been in that moment where our experience is challenging our theology and winning. In your life and in your ministry, one of your greatest pastoral opportunities and responsibilities will be to minister to people who are walking through that same desert themselves. What will you say? Because there are many, far too many, who will choose to walk away from God because the pain, the pain is just too much. I can think of few things that are as toxic to a person's life as maintaining an unforgiving grudge against God. It's just another form of that serpent's question asked of Eve all the way back in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say? Did God really say that he would take care of you? Did God really say that he loved you? Did God really say that he was just? Did God really say? And in anger, we take a bite of that bitter fruit, and it tastes so good for a moment. But in the end, it separates us from our creator. It wrecks our lives. It ruins any chance at true joy or hope. And also in the process, most people don't think about this, but in the process, it renders completely meaningless the suffering that caused the questions in the first place. Abandoning God doesn't make the pain go away. Abandoning God just makes the pain all the more meaningless and absurd. So what about this then? How do we forgive God? How do we do it? Well, we run into some serious problems almost immediately when it comes to forgiving God. Because if you think about it, forgiveness presupposes two very important things. Forgiveness makes two very important assumptions which I may not be justified in making about God. First of all, forgiveness assumes that a wrong has been committed, doesn't it? Forgiveness assumes that a wrong has been committed. Secondly, forgiveness assumes that this wrong has been committed by one guilty party against another innocent or at least less guilty party. So what happens when one of the parties involved in this transaction happens to be the sovereign creator God of the universe? Well, what happens is you have to rethink each one of those assumptions. I'll start with the second one first. Is it ever legitimate for me to make the judgment that God is guilty, that God has wronged me, the innocent party? 
Is it ever legitimate for me to come to those conclusions? Because you see, when bad things happen, here's our human tendency. When bad things happen, our first inclination is to assign blame. When you get in a car accident, the very first question that's asked is, well, whose fault was it? Who caused this to to happen? Who's responsible? Who do I send the insurance check to? And it's only natural that God is going to receive the blame eventually. After all, isn't he supposed to be in charge of this universe that he created? Isn't he supposed to be in control? Now, it's very easy to get this idea from the book of Lamentations. There is no other way to see this book than to recognize that Jeremiah is, in fact, angry at God and holding him responsible for what has happened to Israel. But if you take a second look at Lamentations, what you also see is that Jeremiah reminds us that there are times when our complaints, when our frustrations, and when our anger should rightfully be spoken into the mirror. In the very first chapter of Lamentations, Jeremiah acknowledges that much of the pain that the nation was feeling was brought about by their own unfaithfulness. In Lamentations 1, verse 5, it says, The Lord has brought her grief because of her many sins. Lamentations 1, 8, Jeremiah had sinned, Jeremiah has sinned greatly and so has become unclean. As gruesome as it was, as painful as it was, Jeremiah acknowledges, recognizes that Jerusalem had brought this judgment upon themselves. And as unpopular as this is to say, this is sometimes true for us as well. The suffering that we endure, which we are so quick to assign to God, is sometimes the consequence of our own choices or oftentimes the choices made by others on our behalf. At other times, we have to admit that we really don't know who is at fault or who caused this pain in my life. One of, and I've told this story many times. Many of you know that one of the most formative events that ever happened in my life was losing my sister in a car accident when I was in high school. And I, I remember after that accident, I had people give me all sorts of answers to this question. Who was at fault? What brought this about? Who caused this? I had Christian people in my life that, that told me that the accident that my sister had was caused by God to protect our family or to maybe to test our family. Or I had other Christian people tell me that God simply needed another angel in his heavenly choir. Gag. Don't ever say that nonsense to somebody please just do everybody a favor don't talk about heavenly choirs and angels it's just offensive on multiple different levels um but i had i had people say other people came along and they said the opposite other people said you know satan caused this satan caused this my dad's a minister my dad's a preacher satan caused this to harm your family to harm the church satan did this because it was evil I had other people, you know, the police told us that the reason why the car accident happened was because she was driving on a curvy road in late April. The road was wet. She was not paying attention to what she was doing. She didn't have her seatbelt on, and this is what happens. This was a natural consequence of, of what happened. So who's, who's really at fault? Did God cause it? Did God allow it? Was this God's plan from the very beginning before the dawn of time? Or was this just a tragic consequence of living in a world where car accidents happen? Can I tell you that years later, studying scripture, studying theology, praying about this, meditating on this, it still remains a mystery to me to this day. I gave up asking the question. Because it's just impossible to ever really know for sure who is responsible when bad things happen. And at the end of the day, does it matter? Does it really matter? Being angry at God doesn't get me anywhere, and it brought me no satisfaction. Playing metaphysical whodunit doesn't really change the facts of the situation. So that's the first assumption. Which leads me back to this other assumption that we make in forgiveness, the assumption that a wrong has been committed. Which on the surface of it sounds completely ridiculous and insulting, and I hesitate to even say it, but it has to be said. Of course what happened to me or my family or my nation is wrong. Are you kidding me? Of course what happened is unjust and evil. How could it possibly be understood in any other way? But we're not always in the best position to judge what is wrong in any universal sense, are we? 
let me illustrate this point. Some of you have heard me give this illustration before, but I was, uh, I was having lunch one day with a good friend of mine named Brandon. And uh, Brandon, their family, is, they've had some challenges of their own. Uh, they have a daughter with some pretty serious special needs and some health problems. And, and um, so we were having lunch one day, and he was talking about his beautiful daughter, but also talking about some of the challenges that they had as a family and, and asking the types of questions that good Christian people ask, wondering what was the purpose of this and how were they going to get through this and where was God in the midst of this. Um, good, solid questions. And so we were talking, and I was talking about my own experience and some of our own family's challenges, and we were talk- the, the conversation eventually went back to my sister's car accident years ago, and, and, uh, and Brandon asked me a very profound question, something that I'd never thought of before. But Brandon said, now, Chad, if, you, if there was a red button on this table, if there were a red button on this table and you pressed this button and everything went away, everything changed. Your sister didn't have that car accident. Your sister is still living today. She's with you today. Would you press that button? On the surface of it, you think, well, of course, obviously. What kind, what kind of an uncaring idiot do you think I am? Of course, I'd press that button, I mean, in a matter of seconds. I wouldn't even think about it. To have my sister back, to have her back in my life. But then when you pause and you really start to think a little bit more deeply about it, you start to, you start to hesitate a little bit. Because I realized all the things that have happened in my life since then, because of my sister's car accident, and I won't tell the whole story, but, but my sister's accident was one of the key factors that eventually led me to con- considering Bible college as a place to pursue my education. Um, it was one, it was, I'm not sure I would have ended up at Bible college had that not happened in our family. Once I, was at, once I was at a Christian college, that, that led to me considering more seriously the prospect of ministry with my life, something that I'd never considered up to that point. It was in the context of being on that Christian college campus where, yes, I did meet my wife at Bible college, no shame in that, um, and she's here today. Um, I met my wife, uh, Tara, uh, at Bible college. We ended up getting married. We have now three beautiful kids of our own. Um, I also think about my parents. Uh, if my sister's car accident had never happened, they probably never would have considering mo- considered moving to a place like Orinogo, Missouri to do ministry in Orinogo, Missouri. I mean, who, who would move to Orinogo, Missouri to do ministry? Um, at least that's what we thought. But they came down here, and if they hadn't moved to Orinogo, Missouri, I never would have become familiar with a place called Ozark Christian College. I never would have had the opportunity to teach and to enjoy investing in in students as they discover God's purpose for, my li- for their life. I also think of my beautiful sister, Nerlita, who, uh, who we were able to adopt and who's now a junior at Ozark. And I, and I think about her blessing in my life and how privileged I am to be her brother. And I think about all those things, all those things that have happened since my sister's accident. And if I press that button, all those blessings go away. If I press that button, I lose my ministry at Ozark. If I press that button, I lose my sister. If I press that button, I lose my kids. I lose my wife. Now think about the question again. Would you press that button? The stakes have changed, haven't they? And so what this taught me is I'm not necessarily always in a position to be a judge on what is universally wrong for my life. There are two common mistakes that I make about my relationship with God, and I think you probably make the same mistakes. First of all, I assume that God's primary purpose for my life is to make me happy. Whereas God's primary purpose for my life is not really my happiness at all, but more my holiness. So when bad things happen, I'm busy complaining about my happiness while God is asking the question, who ever told you that the number one purpose in life was to be happy? Our second problem is that often our pain and suffering are so intense that it's impossible for us to see beyond our suffering to a greater plan and purpose in our life, to see how God may redeem this situation for his glory. We can't see it because we're in so much pain in the moment. To see those times, how those times of desert wanderings, as painful and miserable as they might be, might actually work in us in the way they did for people like Moses and David and Israel and even Jesus himself as that season where God was preparing us preparing us for something greater than we could ever imagine before. 
I'm sorry today because I feel like this message is full of a lot more questions than it is answers. But that's only because I'm trying to be honest. Maybe what would be better for us to talk about is what to do when we're angry with God. Maybe that would be better. And so one of the lessons that I learned from the book of Lamentations is just this. God can handle your anger. God can handle your anger. Lamentations is not a fun book, but it's an honest book. And Israel wasn't embarrassed by the book of Lamentations. They didn't hide it away. In fact, they wanted to remember their time of national lament. Remembering their sorrow and abandonment was important to them. And so this book was one of five books in the Old Testament that was sung publicly every year as a part of a national feast day. That's how important the book of Lamentations was. I want to say to you this today as clearly as I can. God can handle your anger. God can handle your confusion, your frustration. You don't have to be falsely happy to a God who knows you better than yourself. Just as a parent learns to patiently endure the anger and frustration of her child because she knows that no matter what happens, I love this child. Your God can handle your questions, your tears, your anger, and your loneliness. But the second thing that I learned from Lamentations, this is the last thing that I'll talk about today. The, la the second thing that I learned from Lamentations is this. It might be the most important thing. The most important thing that we can do when we're angry at God is to worship God. For most people, the only passage of Lamentations that they know is from Lamentations 3. Because we sing it as a hymn. Great is your faithfulness. What most people are unaware of is the context of that passage. In Lamentations 3, 1 through 18... 18 times Jeremiah uses the word he or his of God. The first 18 verses of, Jer of Lamentations 3 are one long complaint and accusation against God. And then he transitions in verse 18 to say this. So I say, my splendor is gone and all that I have from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. He remembers his loss. He remembers his heartache. He, he remembers what his people have given up, and he loses all hope. Yet, when he remembers the Lord, when his focus changes to the Lord... His hope is strangely restored. Verse 21, yet I call this to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. Now this isn't some cheap Taylor Swift sentimentalized and insecure love. This is hesed love, covenantal faithfulness, the type of steadfast, unbreakable love that is grounded in the character of God himself. A love that perseveres when we're going through that desert time, when things are falling apart, when we're encountering times of discipline, a love that is there in the midst of divorce, a love that is there in the midst of cancer, a love that is there in the midst of car accidents, a love that is there in the midst of persecution, a love that is there in the midst of frustrated dreams, God's covenantal faithfulness is secure. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Did you catch that? Great is your faithfulness. In the midst of all of his accusations, a second person pronoun. Great is your faithfulness. He has moved from talking about God to talking to God. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. The Lord is my inheritance. When everything else is taken away, all I'm left with is everything. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it upon him. Let him bury his face in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him offer his cheek to one who would strike him, and let him be filled with disgrace. For, one who is, for no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love. For he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to anyone. I was working on this sermon this week. My daughter is so amazing and so weird. 
Um, <laughs> I don't know where she comes up with this stuff, but apparently she saw Daddy struggling with a sermon. And she came up and she gave me this note. And it says, Dear Daddy, you should always believe, she meant believe, you should always believe in Jesus. He is always with you, even in your toughest moments. Always your daughter, Addie. It sounds a lot like Lamentations. Perhaps the most important thing to do when you're angry at God is to worship God. Oh, but it's hard, isn't it? It's tough. I know when my wife and I have disagreements, yes, it happens. As perfect as I may be, sometimes she just doesn't agree with me. Um, when we have disagreements, when we have quarrels, I'm the type of person that I don't want to talk about it. The last thing that I want to do is talk. I, so I withdraw, so I'm quiet. And so, but the last thing that I want to do is really the most important thing for me to do. When you're angry, when you're frustrated, when you're confused by God, sometimes the last thing you want to do is worship, but it's really the most important thing that you can do is to worship. God's people don't just sing songs of joy. We also sing songs of lament. We don't just sing songs about God's great dance party. We also sing songs like, it is well with my soul. And it's in the exercise of worship that my focus is taken for a moment off of my sufferings. And instead it's placed on a God who is faithful. It's taken off of my happiness and instead it's placed on my hope. And of course this is a Christian sermon, isn't it? We are witnesses of the ultimate faithfulness of God because we live on the other side of the cross. God has not been silent. He has not abandoned us to our afflictions. We see God's faithfulness in ways that Jeremiah could only dream about. But we still worship in hope. We still sing the song of lamentations. Even as we anticipate, even as we hear the whispers of the song of Revelation that tells us, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Would you stand with me as we begin our time of worship this morning? Great is thy faith. 